<coughs> All right, uh, the first speaker today is Todd Drum from Howard University. <laughs> People know, maybe. I'm introducing myself, so that was exciting. All right, um, so I don't know how much I was going to offer. Uh, I don't have very many euros on me, but maybe for every typo you find, you know, I'll give you a little bit. But I found the first one. That was the day I traveled, not the day of the lecture. <laughs> so I don't know why it's up there, but uh, this is just weird. I don't know if I can watch it from here. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is Lorentzian geometry. Um, let's see if we. All right. So we're just, the first couple of slides are going to be very general, very general dimensions. After a while, I'm going to disappoint any physicists who are here and go. Basically, the three dimensions. Most of the talk is going to be about, most of the next three talks are going to be about three dimensions. Um, and I'll tell you why I'm going to disappoint you, and, but uh, there will be other reasons. But it, a lot of this stuff, the general stuff, is all in all dimensions. So we're going to talk about a Lorentzian, a flat Lorentzian space. We're going to actually introduce a little curvature left, later on for fun and excitement. Um, the tangent space is just Rn1. It has and what we're going to do is we're going to choose a, an origin. An affine space doesn't necessarily have an origin. You just to choose a point to be your origin. And we're not going to always write this crap. Where is it? Is this? Oh, oh, it's that one. We're not always going to write. Uh, oh, that was back. That's too bad. OK. We're not always going to. Shoot. OK, now I get it. I'm, I'm clueless. But we're not always going to write uh, this origin very often. But really, you should think of, you know, if you have a, a vector, a, a matrix acting on a point, really it means the point in relationship to that, to that origin. So we're going to make a, an identification between the point and the vector that points from the origin to that point. All right. All right. So let's see. We'll go to the next one. All right. So there's our tangent space. I like to write my vectors vertically. I don't know why. But every once in a while, the same space. I'll just put a little transpose on there to make you happy. Um, and we have the standard indefinite inner product. My wife doesn't call this an inner product. She just calls it, she calls it something strange. She doesn't even know what it took to call it. She's, she's an ergodic theorist, so we don't really know where she is. <laughs> on average, we kind of have an idea, but not very often. Um, <laughs> Anyway, and we're the, the set of matrices which preserve this uh, inner product is going to be O n1. And what do I mean by preserving this inner product? I mean if I multiply by the two vectors by both a, that they're equal to the inner product. And I'm going to use the standard, because I don't want to worry about the cross product and everything, I'm going to use the dot as the standard, the inner product. And later on, maybe not today, but in the next couple of days, I might introduce different, inter different ways to write this inner product. So just be, we're just going to be fluid with this, and we're all going to be sing together soon. Um, we're going to talk about SON1. Those are the ON ones which have determinant 1. Of course, you can have some which have determinant negative 1, which also preserve this inner product. Um, and ON1, and we're going to talk about the connected subgroup uh, containing the identity. So a lot of things we're going to do with, with just that one. So those are, now these are, these matrices are a little bit hard to write. They're not quite as easy to write as just O-N. It's a little bit hard, and it's hard to figure out exactly which they are. And we're going to maybe talk about how to write them in a nicer way, in a sense. All right. All right, so we have our space, and I can only draw in three dimensions when I'm, you know, on every other Thursday, I think I can see in four dimensions, but uh, that's usually chemically induced, and we don't want to do that today. So, so I want to have some, some terminology that comes from physics to talk about these matrices, okay? these vectors, I should say. And the first thing is I'm going to look at all the vectors you can have. Because it's an indefinite inner product, you can take the inner product with itself and get a, a 0. So you can look at the set of vectors which the inner product with themselves is 0. And we'll call that the light cone. That's from physics, right? You can imagine a point. This is like the speed of light, right? You have, like, you have uh, so there a spark goes. And where does the spark go? Where does that spark go? It goes out like that in time. You can think of the third dimension, 
the third dimension is time, and these other two is space, or if you want to actually think about physics, maybe you want to think about three dimensions in space, or 27, I don't know what's the new number. I don't follow it, okay? And again, inside the light cone, right there, the vectors which point inside the light cone are called time-like. They point in the same, uh, and outside are space-like, all coming from the space, the idea of that, that two points here, if there are two points in, in here, if, your vector, if the vector is in here, they differ by something that, which could differ in time. So you could possibly get from that point to the other point in time. If you have two points out here, like a point here and a point there, you can't get to there in time. You could maybe join up later, but you can't get to that point in the same amount of time. So they differ space. The, the ones on the outside differ space-like, and the ones on the inside differ time-like. All right. Now here's one thing that turns out to be an interesting little tidbit, right? This, the Lorentzian geometry doesn't necessarily define what, time, what uh, future is or past. So you have to go ahead and say, I'm going to declare. There's another piece of information that you need. And one of the things you do is you declare. You say, I want this upper nap to be my future or this to be my past. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit about what can happen when you mix up future and past and what you get weird things happening. Maybe they're not physical. Maybe they are. We don't know. Um, so. so we have time like... All right, so one of the big deals of all of this, and the, the, what I want to push through this, is that whenever you have Lorentzian geometry, you also have hyperbolic geometry. And there's a model of hy the hyperbolic space that sits inside hyper. In fact, we're going to write a couple more later on. They all sit inside here. But one of the models that I, I like in particular is this, the very physical model of the, sh the hyperboloid, right? You take all the vectors whose inner product with themselves is negative 1, Okay, and you can actually take the one, there's a negative nap too, there's a hyperbolic plane in the bottom there, okay, but that's a very nice physical model, uh, and what I think is one of the more natural models of, the, probably the, mo the most natural model of hyperbolic space, really nice, nice thing. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through the differential geometry, but it does, you, are, you define a metric of constant curvature negative 1. This hyperboloid has a constant, and it's defined by the inner product, you know, the sta standard inner product. Um, okay, geodesics through uh, in this, this model, and this, is, this doesn't have to be in two dimension, three dimensions. This could be in higher dimensions. Um, but geodesics are the intersections of planes through the origin and the hyperboloid. Okay? All right. Now, there's other related models to this, and one of them is, of course, the projective model. We can think of points as just collection, the lines, and we just say every line is a point. We like to talk about projective model, um, where we allow, and we're going to write these sometimes. I don't know how much we're going to write these things. But we're going to write these classes of points. So we'll have a vector here, but we want this to represent all the vectors which are a non-zero uh, non, non multiple of that vector. Okay. And we're going to do a little bit of the projective model, but one of the things that's going to come up again is the Klein model, which is kind of like the, the projective model, but intersected with, or you can just project onto the, v, the, the nth dimension being one. What? All right, so uh, do I owe you money now? Okay, so my first, my first, this is really n plus 1, so this should be the n plus 1, right? I, I, I've dropped an extra n plus 1 right there, and that should be an n plus 1 right there. We owe John, I guess, a dinner. It will be a crappy dinner. <laughs> That's right. We're back. We're even. <laughs> I owe him a cheesesteak. You have to come to Philadelphia for that one. OK, so, so we have these models of hyperbo uh, hyperbolic space that live inside of, of Lorentzian geometry all the time. Okay, And we're going to play that against each other a lot. As we go further and further in, we're going to play that. We're going to look at what these mean. All right, so, okay, so we're going to talk about 
isometries, as I said before, the, the linear isometries, um, they have ON plus one has uh, four connected components. It has the two connected components, which are SON1 and the, neg the, the, neg neg the, the ones with determinant negative one. But it also has the orientation reversing things, too. So you get four connected components there. And these are isometries. You can think of all these as isometries of HN, HN, right? The hyperbolic in space. OK. Um, now, an affine isometry is something that we don't, I, I don't remember seeing that early in my career, right? So an affine isometry is you hit it with a matrix, and then you, then you translate it. So you take an element like this, and here you're taking an element of ON plus 1, and then you're translating it by a vector, right? I like the little different scripts. Other people don't like that. They get a little weep, weepy about these things. But I like the little, just, see, that's a math cow. And, uh, OK, all right. OK, so here's a nice little proposition. I like to write, prove one thing. I think this is the only thing I proved today, OK? If you look at an affine transformation, and this doesn't have to be in any dimension, you know, you, this is dimension, whatever, we haven't, we haven't it, and it doesn't even have to be Lorentzian in that sense. If your A doesn't have eigenvalue 1, then you have a fixed point. Fixed points are going to be bad for us. Maybe they should be good for us. A lot of things should have fixed points, but right now we're, we're going to, it'd be nice to know whether we have a fixed point or not. But in this case, we don't have, and it's a really nice little proof, right? Okay, basically you can solve this equation. You can solve ax plus a is equal to a because ax minus 1, if, one, if a doesn't have 1 as an eigenvalue, you can diagonalize that matrix and you can take its inverse. So it's a really nice thing. Okay. It's a nice little observation. Um, the first, well, anyway, I'm not allowed to say who did it. I was told I, I wasn't allowed to say who, who first observed it. I don't know if it, he first observed it or not, but I'm not allowed to say it. OK. So now I'd like to restrict things. All this stuff was very general. Lots of, lots of very general things. Now I'm starting to talk about three dimensions. Some of this is actually, we can go back and go back and say this is more general. But, um, but let me just start working on three dimensions, because that's what I'm going to work on mostly. Oh, let me say, uh, before I do that, let me say one thing about this, this particular, particular uh, theory, this particular proposition. Here's where um, three dimensions is somewhat more interesting or maybe less interesting than four dimensions, right? In that a generic element, a generic isometry uh, uh, of O21, all elements in O21 have one as an eigenvalue, right? You can prove that. It's not that hard to do. But in, uh, in, SO3, uh, in O31, Generic element, you throw a dart at a dartboard, you hit an element of 031, which I do on occasion. Um, you have a dartboard made of elements of 031. Everyone has one of these, right? OK, they do not have one as an eigenvalue. So generically, you might, you're not going to get, you're going to get fixed points. So you're not going to have what we're going to talk about, proper, free and proper actions on uh, SO31, uh, uh, E31. Yeah. So in some sense, that's kind of why we're going to restrict ourselves to R31, is to not, because we don't want to worry about these. Okay. All right. So now we're going to three dimensions. OK. Um, let me draw. Oh, I have chalk, so I'm going to draw a little bit here. OK. Um, just to remind you, so here we have. There we have our null plane. <laughs> and what's, one gonna, what's gonna be important to this is gonna be looking at uh, lines which are perpendicular to a certain vector, okay? And if you have a vector which is space-like, so you have a vector v which is space-like, the perpendicular is going to intersect this like that, right? Right, like that. And by the way, that also defines a 
geodesic in the hyperbolic plane, because in here there's the hyperbolic plane, right? And the per, a, a, long, a plane through the origin defines a pipe. So a vector will actually define a vector in R two R three one two one will actually define a geodesic in the hyperbolic plane. Okay. On the other hand, if you're light-like, okay. So I'm going to draw another. I can draw a bunch of these. Okay. If you're light-like, the null plane, well, it's null with itself. So, in fact, it's going to be. Oh, that's crap. Okay. That's a terrible picture. But we'll get more pictures of it later, so I'm not going to worry about it. But it's actually tangent to that null, to the light cone. Okay? The null, the vectors which are perpendicular, Lorentzian perpendicular to a light like vector are tangent to the null, null, cone, null cone, which is kind of an interesting point that happens. All right. Um, I should have put the Poincare disk model. I just want to make sure that we understand that, uh, or as a review, hopefully, mostly a review. If you don't, we'll talk about it later. Um, a lot of what we're going to do is going to interplay between the hyperbolic geometry and the Lorentzian geometry. And in the hyperbolic geometry, one of the things I, I, I like to understand how, how to write an isometry. And, and one of the best things about the, the upper half plane model of the hyperbolic geometry, uh, of the, of the hyperbolic geometry is that we have a really nice description of the, iso the isometry group of, of uh, the hyperbolic, uh, of hyperbolic space. And that description is two by two matrices with determinant one. So it's really, really easy to write those down. Now you actually want to not include multiplication by plus or minus one, too. But isometry, so we have this, we're going to have this relationship, a dictionary between elements of SO2 or O21 and PSL2R. And we're going to talk about that dictionary as we go ahead. All right. All right. So what did I say next? OK, so now we have uh, SO21. And I already talked about a little bit about this. So we have an, a generic element of SO21. And I want it to be the identity element. I want the determinant one. I just I, I like, we'll start with the easier parts. There's stuff that goes on with uh, other connected components of SO21, but I'm just going to worry about SO21 for the time being. Um, and uh, we have, they all have eigenvalue 1. I, I think I lied before when I said all elements of O21 have eigenvalue 1. O21 could have eigenvalues 1 or negative 1, but let's just, that's why we like to stay with that. Did I lie before? You didn't want to say you lied, Todd? I'm a liar and a cheat, a lion cheat. But don't forsake me, because I'm not bad. I'm just a little misled. <laughs> that was from a bad song that I know, that no one else does, actually. All right, so there's a classification of, uh, of these elements, these isometries of SO21. OK? And there's the elliptic ones. Their fixed eigenvalue is a time-like eigenvalue. And what it does is it rotates. It's, it's really just a rotation, right? OK. And there's also a parabolic one, which whose fixed value, it, fixed eigenvector is something on, that's light-like. OK. And the orbits, if you look at the orbits on the hyperbolic plane, They'll be horror cycles, if you've heard of horror cycles before. I love a good horror cycle joke. Do you know any horror cycle jokes? I don't know any horror cycle jokes, so. but I'd like a good one. So. But the more interesting part that we're going to hit over and over again today, because we're trying to simplify things, is the hyper, hy, hyperbolic. Okay? So hyper, we're going to talk about hyperbolic um, elements of SO, the identity component of O21 or SO21. And those particular uh, isometries have, uh, uh, orthogonal matrices, have three eigenvalues, okay? And I've been taught, I don't know why. I always like my lambda to be greater than one, but now I've, my lambdas are less than one. And that, that should be, there should be a zero less than that, too. There are three positive uh, real eigenvalues, 
Okay? And let me just draw this, draw it up here again. I don't know if I have the picture later. I have this picture on a lot of things. Okay. So you have a hyperbolic element, and this is, so this is A, and this is A naught. It's going to be space-like. It's not hard, it's, it's not obvious, but it's not hard to prove that that is going to be space-like. <coughs> and you're going to have an expanding and contracting vector, right? There's going to be one that's bigger, whose eigenvalue is bigger than one, and one that's less than one. Okay. All right, and so a little bit of thought, and you'll realize that the expanding and the contracting eigenvectors have to be null vectors. Because if they weren't, where, what would you do? You would go to a different, you would change the eigenvector, you would change the length of them. If you were here in the time length, you'd move it straight up, and you'd be on a different hyperbola. So this is going to be a and a plus, right? The, uh, the expanding and tracking vectors are points on the boundary of hyperbolic space, if you want, because that's kind of a boundary of hyperbolic space, right? The hyperbolic plane is living in here. It's a tiny little plane today, okay? A plus and A minus are, are the are eigenvectors. Okay, so. Am I going too fast? I feel like I'm going too fast. All right, and um, I'll also call, uh, by the way, these are, for the same reason, this, vect this plane that's defined by A plus and A minus has to be Lorentzian perpendicular to A naught. Right? And again, it would be, because you're in track, you, one would be multiplication, right? It has to be that it's zero, because otherwise you would multiply by a K. I can write that down if you want. By the way, feel free to stop me and say you're confusing me or stop, stop talking. Uh, that's what people have used, used to, my wife asks me that every day. Just stop <laughs> talking. Every day she says that. Uh, my kids really do say that. <laughs> my wife doesn't always say that, but my kids actually do say that. Dad, just stop. stop. But anyway, it's perpendicular to this. Right? So that A naught defines that plane that goes from A plus to A minus. All right, we're going to talk about the, aff the these are just elements of SO2-1. They're just the linear part, right? There's the linear, they're the matrix part of that. There's also a transformation. We're not going to really, we're going to talk about those affine transformations. We're going to say whether they're hyper, uh, elliptic, parabolic, or hyperbolic, just because of what the linear part does. Okay. Okay, so now we get to have a little fun. So now we get to choose, we have to choose, there's, there's, there's lots of choices for A naught, A plus, and A minus, right? Lots of cho choices for that. Um, we can choose A plus or A minus on this, uh, to be future pointing, okay? You can actually choose it without the n notion of future and past too, just so that they're on the same nap. But well, let's just let's make ourselves easy. Let's assume we have a future. Um, you know, maybe you all have a future. It's unclear whether I do. I do have a past, but we don't want to go there. <laughs> okay, and we're going to make an arbitrary assumption that we're going to have Euclidean length one because that's really what what how long those vectors those are null vectors as opposed uh, as. What the, Euclid, what the Lorentzian geometry is. So how long it is doesn't really make any sense to stop, talk about a length. But we're just going to assume it's going to be Euclidean length one. You don't actually have to make that assumption. You just have to assume that it is non-zero. OK, but let's just assume that. OK. Um, I don't know if I maybe was, was it on a thing? Huh. I forget. Did I talk about the? I, I know I didn't say anything about it, but there. Not only do you have an uh, inner product, because you have three dimensions, you also have a cross product, too. The same properties work through the cross product. Um, that when you take the dot product with the cross product, the two vectors, it's just the determinant of those 
vectors, right? It's Lorentzian perpendicular. Um, uh, and you can choose that when you take the cross product of a naught and a minus, a minus and a plus, they go to a, a naught. And mo most importantly, that it's greater than zero. So what does that mean? It means that you have a dot. Pro so you're, what you're defining is an orientation for your space. You want to choose, because there are two different directions. For a, a plus and a minus, we're talking about future or past, right? We say their future, that defines the vector. No, it doesn't define the length, but we'll fix the length, right? But a naught has a problem. A naught has that direction or that direction. And there's, there's a particular direction that we get to pick. And that's that when we take the cross product, right-hand rule, right? Did you ever teach the, it's great to teach a right-hand rule question. I, I taught, uh, taught a little physics, and I love to see the students all working on their exam. What, what, which way is that going? Okay, right-hand rule, it points in the same direction. So you want the x, the minus to the plus to point in the same direction as the a naught. Okay? So that will define it. Okay. All right. We already talked about the a naught, per determining the axis for a naught. Okay. All right. So that's that's a really important point. That given these two things that living in the upper nap, the 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 future, right? Given that 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 determines the direction for a naught, determines which direction you are. Okay. It's going to come up to be a big deal right now. All right, so now we get to define a Margulis invariant. Okay. This is going to be the one of the more interesting things that we're not, we're not going to prove the, uh, prove the big things about the Margulis invariant, but we're just going to define it. Okay. The first thing before I go any further is that if you have a hyperbolic element, if you have a hyperbolic affine transformation, it take, again, it takes a little bit of ge uh, algebra, but you can show there is a fixed, a one, a unique fixed line that's parallel to x naught. Right. So, if you have an affine transformation, I don't know where it is, but it's it's sitting right here. Right. Somewhere here. See out, and what out a does to it, it moves along this line by translation. Right. Everything's moved by translation, which is. Not hard to see. So there's the line. And all you know is that it's in the direction of a naught. OK? All right. Takes a little bit of algebra to prove it. Not so bad to do. OK? And what we're going to say is we're going to look at the Margulis invariant. As you take a point on the, that invariant line, you see how far your your affine transformation moves you along that air invariant line, and then you say, how far did we move? Well, we need something of unit length. Well, what do we have in unit length? A naught. So we're going to measure it. Okay, how far you moved, right? Ax minus x dotted with A naught. Pretty straightforward thing to do. But it has an interesting consequence. This is a, a, a length, right? And if you want to think about it, it's, if you want to think about it as you take all of A, all of En, all of E21, you mod out by this cyclic group. I think this is not working, but anyway just by generated by this element, what you're going to get is you're going to take two, you're going to, you're going to get some sort of torus, some sort of filled in torus, right? A solid torus, torus. And there's going to be a unique closed geodesic on that torus. Right? And what is, what is the Margulis invariant measuring? It's measuring the length, the Lorentzian length of that unique closed geodesic. But it has an interesting point, is that it could have a negative length. And that's going to be, that's going to come up in a second. Okay. So the Margulis invariant, Mar and I'll tell you a little story about what 
what Margulis told me one time about when he came up with it and what he was trying to prove, but you know, in a second. All right. So it's, what, it's another way to think of the Margulis invariant. It's just the sign Lorentzian length of that unique closed geodesic. Okay. All right. Okay, so, um, oh shoot, that was not that one. Okay. So the w first thing is that uh, is the, the Margulis invariant is zero if and only if you have a closed po a fixed point. Um, in fact, the way you get the information, you get the, 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 w the way you understand this sine Lorentzian length is to restrict x to this closed geodesic. But it works, it, it works no matter where you are. You can take an x off that line because the motion, the other motion is perpendicular to x a naught, so it just doesn't even notice the other motion. So really, you don't even have to worry about what x you pick. But the, the understanding of the definition, the, the meaning behind the, the Margulis invariant comes from the fact of picking the x on the, on, the, on the axis, but you don't really have to do that, okay? It's a class function, it's invariant under conjugation, nice little, and here's probably the most interesting property, and that is this one right here. Alpha of a to the n is the absolute value of n alpha of a. Okay. Well, let's let's draw a pic let's draw a couple of pictures before we get any further. Okay, because I think these kind of a good picture to draw. Okay, so here we have an app information, and here we're going to go, and this is x plus, a plus, and a minus, and a transformation that goes to x, a of x, x goes to a of x, right? Okay. Now you do the same thing, you take the inverse, take the inverse of that. The inverse, which way does the inverse move? It moves opposite direction. I can do that. I'm good at that. Right? But what happens to x plus and x a, a plus and a minus when you take the inverse? Well, one is contracting and one is expanding, right? So you're switching the expansion and the contraction. So what happens is that when you go the inverse, this is a inverse plus a inverse minus. I don't think that's a good picture, but the idea is you're changing the direction. So you're changing a, in particular, uh, a naught they're, they're, they're the negatives of each other, okay? So no matter what happens, this tells you a sign Lorentz. It's invariant under change going from A to A inverse. Okay. That's wacky. And I'll tell you something even wackier in about a second or two. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, okay. I want to tell you what proper actions were. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you write a few lectures. It's like, oh no, what did I say here? Okay, I just want to uh, talk about proper uh, actions just for a second. So, what we're going to be interested in, in the next part of this is to talk about what which ones are proper actions. In other words, what what do I mean by proper action? There's a definition. It's, it, it, we'll go through the definitions. But basically, it means if you if you have a group which act which is discrete and acts properly or for those of you who learned mathematics not from my advisor, uh, properly discontinuous, a free and properly discontinuous action, okay, you get, what, what the nice part is you get a manifold when you mod out by that manifold, mod out by that group, okay? All right. There, um, and in particular, if you talk about not Lorentzian's case, you'd have an old Old school, uh, 19, I don't even know when Bieberbach, I know he's alive because he wasn't, uh, he might not have been a nice guy all of his life, but uh, uh, I know he was alive during the World War II or right before World War II. Um, but basically for Euclidean motions, you know that all the proper actions you get are either they're 
they're either uh, Zn's or they're finite covers of Zn's. Okay. <coughs> and then you start to say, well, do we have another question like that? Do we have another theorem like this for co-compact affine actions? And by the way, this was for a compact set, co-compact. All right. So we have a conjecture by Auslander which says that if you um, if you have a discrete group which acts properly, then G is virtually solvable. Now I don't know too much about algebra, but I know virtually so one th one group which is not virtually solvable is free groups. Anything that has a free group is not virtually solvable. That's what I know. Okay. All right, and it's true up to dimension six. It was uh, fr golden. Fr Freed and Goldman proved it in dimension three and did a lot of things. They proved it in, it's true for affine, uh, for Lorentzian actions too. In fact, they proved it for Lorentzian stuff, that if it's compact that you actually have this. Um, one of the questions, that, uh, Milner wrote a paper, a beautiful paper where he, uh, does Milner write crappy papers? Maybe he does, I don't think so. Uh, I think he writes pretty much good papers all the time. Um, anyway, he said, he wondered whether it was going to be true if you took away the compactness. Okay? All right. So now we'll go on. I don't know. That was a little aside. Okay. And the answer to Milder's, uh, the Milder's conjecture is no. And we're going to, we're, that's the end result of what we're going to talk about today. Okay. So let's go back. That, that was an aside. Now we're going to go back to uh, Margulis's affine, uh, Margulis's um, invariant. Okay. Margulis, as he explained it to me one time, he said, I was actually, he was actually trying to prove uh, Auslander's conjecture for Lorentzian geometry, or even, even uh, the question that Milner said. And I don't, don't put conjecture because he did not conjecture it. He just said, I wonder whether that's true. Okay, he was actually trying to prove it's not true. And one of the ways he, one of the things he did was he proved the opposite sign lemma. And the opposite sign lemma goes like this. It goes, if you have two elements which have opposite signs, right, then the group that they sit inside cannot act properly on this. Okay? And he thought he, he was done. Right? He thought he'd always be able to find things with opposite signs. And what I'm going to tell you and what we know is that we can actually find things where they're all the same sign. We're all the same sign. Okay? So this is the opposite sign one. All right. Um, okay, so for whatever, whenever we find affine, uh, whenever we find these, these uh, proper actions, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, okay? We're going to, whenever you have a, a Lorentzian affine action, which is, then you always know that the signs of all the, all the elements in the group are all the same. Okay. Now, here's the weird things that happen. Um, you can define this same thing. There's always a, a, every element. If you look at the, uh, look at, increase the dimension, but don't think of Lorentzian groups anymore, but increase the signature, right, to, Instead of R21, so it's the standard metric with two pluses and one minus. That's the Lorentzian group. But if you increase it to four pluses and three minuses, or three pluses and two minuses, right? Those groups all are real split. They all have one as an eigenvalue, and they get eigenvalues. So it's very similar. Okay. So a lot of a lot of this discussion, a lot of what we we're discussing today can be extended to these higher dimensions. But not the higher dimensions that you want to do it, not SO31, but SO32, SO43, SO65. I can't, I, I can't do arithmetic today. Okay? You can keep doing it. But in every other dimension, so in the 3-2 dimension and in the 5-4 the dimension, what happens is that when you take the inverse, because of the number of x a pluses and the other the one the number of expanding contractions and the number of contracting directions, okay, you actually get that the 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 Margulis invariant of the inverse is negative the original, 
And so you can never get counterexamples to uh, Al you, 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 you never get counterexamples to Auslander's or, or Milner's conjectures in those dimensions. It's every so a lot of what you'll see if you see uh, Grisha talk, uh, Margulis talk, or Soifer, they're interested in understanding these higher dimensional uh, what we're doing in higher dimensions, but in every, four three, six five, everything going up from there. All right, so it's very, it's a wacky thing. All right, so the first examples of these things, which we're going to talk about in more detail, are uh, were constructed by Margulis. I've read the paper. I don't think anybody else should. No, no. <laughs> it's a hard paper to read. It's a lot of estimates, a lot of really, really hard things. You don't really see what's going on. Okay, and these are what there are proper actions which are not, which are not uh, solvable. So they're, they're going to be free groups. We're going to usually find free groups which act nicely on this thing. So that's what we're interested in finding: free groups that act nicely on this thing. All right. So now, so the next examples that that were done were originally done by, well, a long time ago, let's just say it. Let's not say who they're, they're done by, but a long, long time ago. Some of us are a little bit older than we should be. <coughs> or used to be. <laughs> That's right, my future pastoral. <laughs> and the idea is to take what happened, because all of this is happening on the hyperbolic surface too, right? To take what's happening in a hyperbolic surface and move it up to the affine, to the Lorentzian surface. Right? That's what we want to do. OK, so let's think about, so what we're going to try to find are proper actions, free groups. Let's make it easy. We're not going to talk about extensions of free groups. In fact, the free groups is pretty much it. Well, not. there's the triangle groups, too, a little bit. OK, that act, pro, that act nicely on, on E, E21, right? Affine two space, Lorentzian space. And what we're going to do is mimic it on what happens in the hyperbolic plane. Well, what happens in the hyperbolic plane? How do you make a free group in the hyperbolic plane? Well, you take an element which oh, I, trend, takes the red circle of the red, red geodesic or the blue geodesic to the blue geodesic, right? And you can look at, you know, Masky combinations or whatever you want to talk about, you can talk about all the big words that you want, but you get a free group of free group actions. Okay. All right, and that's the way we build these all, all these times. The fundamental group, the fundamental domain of this is the region that's bounded between the the four disjoint axes. The action is from the red to the red, the blue to the blue, like that. Okay. We want to take this picture and we want to see, does there, can we draw a picture like this in a higher dimension, in Lorentzian geometry? Okay, and so let's start to draw that. Okay, so the problem with this is that we have to take a line and we have to extend it to some surface, now a plane. But if you extend it to planes, planes in general are going to intersect. They're just, you put a bunch of points, you get two parallel points, but there's going to be a lot of intersection. You're not going to be able to deal with that. It's not going to work. Okay? So there's got to be a way to extend this notion of a line to, to a plane or to something, to something of co-dimension one, right? Some planar surface. Let's see if we can do that. All right. And we have a crooked plane. That's what, of course, everything should be. You take a line and you move it up to a plane, and now you have a crooked plane. All right, so let's see if we can see what this, what this crooked plane is doing. I have to I go, I can't do that. Okay. So crooked plane is made out of four pieces, right? They're the pieces which are inside the light cone, right? There's, and we'll call them the stems. There's this part, and there's this, another part down there. It's like the continuation of that, that plane. It's the same plane going down. And they're identified by the projective geometry, but basically they're, they're telling you, and you can see the hyperbolic geodesic in there, right? That's the intersection of that stem with that hyperboloid. 
right? Well, actually, that's not the hyperboloid, but it's close enough. Oh, no, it is. It is. I have the hyperboloid in there. There you can see the hyperboloid. There's the picture of H2 in there. So that's easy enough. And then how do you connect those two is the problem. And you connect them by taking half planes, which are tangent, perp Lorentzian perpendicular, but tangent at those two points called we call the hinges. I don't use that term very often, but we'll call those the hinges. Those are the wings, and there's the stem. I got grief from, from uh, who was it, uh, Toronto. Who does, who does geometry, the woman who does geometry in, in Toronto? Anyway, symplectic, more symplectic. Anyway, she said it disturbed her because stems were like a, uh, a plant and wings were an animal, and we were mixing the two. She was very upset about that, and I had to agree that she was right. All right, and so now you can start to, if you get a 3D printer, you can start to build these things, right? You can ask them to build. You put a little distance, and I'll tell you, I can tell you a little bit more about this. We're not going to talk about these particular examples, but here you can see. So here's, here's a stem, right? There, each one of these boundaries, and there's a wing, right? right? Stem and wing. This is going to be a triangle. Basically, this is an affine triangle, Lorentzian triangle, a triangle or a prism, if you want. Okay, bounded by three crooked planes. Okay, and they all fit together because it's going to be a, a tile. I'm going to tell you this. Um, I saw a lecture. Well, I was at a lecture that Bill Goldman was giving, and he actually was the one who uh, arranged for these to be made, and he sent them around the audience, and these two. Two young women were, were like working on them. They couldn't get them to work, and I, they're like passing them to me, and I kind of like, like said, I take them, and I just go, boom, 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 and they're all fitting together, and they go, that was amazing. And I said, I've been thinking about these a little bit too long for that to be amazing. <laughs> but anyway, if you want to play with these and look at them, um, they all fit together. You can see it. You can pass it around. You can play with one of Look at them. But these are crooked, what we call crooked planes. And they're kind of the answer <coughs> to how we can deal, well, I can deal, with, with the question, which is how to make a proper disc discrete action. Um, by the way, there's also, a cro if everything, if you've got a crooked plane, you've got a crooked, two crooked half spaces. One of the things about a crooked plane is it divides <coughs> the Lorentzian, Lorentzian space into two pieces. It divides it into that piece and to the other piece, right? It, it dividing the two paces. So we'll call those crooked half spaces. Anything we, we just started calling things crooked. And I can blame Bill for that because he, he liked it a little bit more. He was the one who came up with the crooked. And if you want to blame Bill, Bill Goldman, feel free to do that. Oh, I'm supposed to be nice to my co-authors today. I forgot that. Okay. All right. So I have a little theorem that if you have Basically, that if you have a bunch of disjoint, mutually disjoint crooked planes, okay, for, well, I took crooked uh, half spaces, right? These are kind of the complements, right? If you want to think it, so instead of the crooked half space, you want to think of it like these are this, the analog of the crooked half space is like that's a crooked, that's going to be that half space, that half space. So you have these two n half spaces. And then, um, and you have this that A goes to the complement, that it takes the, that half space to the complement of the other half space, right? Then gamma is proper. Okay. Okay, so now how, the question is, how do you find proper action? So how are we going to find proper actions? So we're going to start with uh, a free discrete linear group. In other words, we're going to start with a picture in a hyperbolic plane def defined by these two n geodesics, and we're going to build. Uh, we're going to put a bunch of crooked half space, uh, crooked half planes around. And what you have to get used to is that you, you can see pretty easy by just starting to draw this. Is that 
if you have a, a geodesic, if you have two geodesics and you draw the crooked planes, they don't intersect. The only place they intersect is at the origin. Okay? Because they kind of wrap around, they have a weird, because of the, the way you do it, they kind of wrap around each other. And you can see them on the, these examples. It, they're kind of twisting. They're, there's no curvature. Well, there is curvature, but there's no really curving, right? There's no thing that's, but somehow they're wrapping around because you're, the way you're putting these things together. All right, and then you separate them. You just say, okay, I've got these, these two n geodesics, and I move them away, okay, all right, from each other. And then I, that moving away does give rise to a proper deformation. You can find, an, you can find a Lorentzian transformation which moves one geodesic. Once you've moved them away, you can find it one that moves that crooked plane to the next crooked plane, right? All right, so let's see if we can see this picture. So here we have the picture of them. They're sitting there. There you have, uh, I have four in this picture, right? So there's one crooked plane. There's another crooked plane. Here's a third crooked plane. And there's the fourth crooked plane. And so now I want to be able to separate them. I want to be able to move them. And you can tell by looking at them. Once you, there's a nice place, place to move them. You can just move them in this in the stem, the stem is defined by a plane. So if you move them in that a quadrant in the stem, they move away from each other. It's a little bit of seeing it, but it, so in a sense, what one way to think about this is you're just moving. If I just took these crooked planes and I just moved them like in a vector that goes that way, right? And moves that way. And this one, so they're all moving away from each other in a way, right? They're moving away in this plane. So you want to take a vector right along here. Okay. And there's a whole space of these vectors. Okay, there's a whole quadrant of these vectors that you can move them away. Actually, there's a little bit more wiggle than you might imagine, but the way you prove things is you want to actually make it a little bit concrete. So, all right. All right, so I'm going way too fast because I'm almost at the end of today, but it's always good to end early. I don't care what. People say hour, hour, and 15 minutes. I'm now at 45 minutes. Have I gone only 45 minutes? Gosh. Or am I 145, 115? OK. Well, anyway, I'm going to quit anyway at some point. OK. Um, so here's the, here's the theorem that's nice, right? I, if I give you a free discrete group in, in SO21, I can find, for every free discrete group that you can do, I can find a transformation which, which uh, proper uh, uh, an affine deformation which which uh, whose underlying group is that that element right Let's see if I can say that right I give you a linear group then I can find a affine set of affine transformations whose linear group is the same is that original one for every one of those linear groups I can find an affine one it's free discrete okay and what we're going to do, the next lecture is going to show you a lot more of these things, draw some pictures, do other things, okay? <laughs> so there's a, there was a conjecture. There was a conjecture, Fanny. There was a conjecture. It's no longer a conjecture. <laughs> um, it basically said any free discrete group which acts freely and pro uh, free, uh, uh, freely, any free group which acts discreetly and properly on affine space must be, you can find crooked planes which bound it. Okay, we called it the crooked plane conjecture. We even named it. Okay, uh, Goldman and I. And uh, then we have this, and I'm not going to tell you how they did it because they didn't do it the right way. They did it the wrong way, a much cl more clever way, much more insightful way, just depressing the living daylights out of me. They're too smart, they're too nice, and they're too hardworking, Danziger, Garato, and Cassell. And they were able to prove this. They were able to prove that every prop free proper action is you can find a fundamental domain bounded by four disc discrete uh, crooked planes. But they don't use it by, they don't actually prove it by doing something, but they prove it by a different method, which is all relating to it. 
uh, and w that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tomorrow, is understanding all of this from a, to, to what's actually happening in, w uh, uh, on the underlying surface. You're actually going to deform the underlying surface. And they deform the underlying surface. They understand this in a really striking way. So I went really fast, so we'll stop there. Since, I, since I'm the only one, is there any questions? Does anybody have a question? Because I can go on for a long time. We could... The one crooked plane or the? This one or this one or the one? First one, right. Yeah, you can't see through it as much. So I can do this. Where's Francois? Because he can draw these better than I can. <laughs> I, I've seen him do it. It's like, gee whiz, how do you draw these things? He goes, well, you draw a thousand, and it gets easy. So I always, no matter what, I always start with the light plane. What? Yeah, yeah. There's two wings. Yeah, there's, that's a wing right there, and that's a wing. So you take this, for instance, if you want to take it like, like uh, I like to do them a little bit off like that. So there's your, there's your stem. Right? And then you take a wing, you, you take, you go half plane. This one connects to down here. There's the half plane. And you over here, you take this half plane, and it goes in the front to that half plane. A great question. Why don't I take the other? What did I have before? I had, what, what was the first theorem that I talked about in this, this thing? Was Margulis' opposite sine lemma, right? So one of the things you can prove is that if you pick the right ones, I probably picked the negative one. I, I don't know which ones I picked. But if you have two crooked planes which are separated, right, and you have, and that the uh, alpha that does this, the, the transformation that does this is has a positive uh, Margulis invariant, okay, there's only one set of those choices that you can make, right? If you choose the other one, they'll always intersect. So the choice of which, ha which set of half planes you choose to make these separate is equivalent to choosing, <coughs> to making your choice of, uh, of the sign of your Margulis invariant. And they all have to be the same, right? right? And if you have two, by the way, if you take a half plane, if you take any other half plane here and you go in the other direction, it's always going to intersect and you can't, move them, you can't move them away from each other. There's just always going to intersect. So, they're, so, so that the alpha, the Margulis is alpha, and the, the choice of which one of these things is, which you pick is, 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 is really intertwined. You have to do a certain one, right? A certain direction. Well, I forget which ones. I think I've changed the, we've changed the way we, we positively oriented or extend. I don't even know the names anymore. But the, that direction that you pick has to be consistent. Does that help? We actually get, uh, the, the, you can make orbifolds. You can do orbifolds with, like, um, uh, Virginie uh, Charette has a paper about um, uh, triangle, tri taking like that, that thing. Uh, if you look at that picture, that red one in the middle, and you reflect across this, uh, the, the, what we call the spine, because on this crooked plane, not only do we have a, uh, a uh, wing and a stem. We also have a spine, and there's one unique, unique space-like vector on that. And if you take a reflection in that spine, a Lorentzian reflection in that spine, it just reverses them. Okay. So let. Do I have those things? Do I have those back? I want to show you a theorem. Sorry. Okay. So I I, I told you. 
that um, I would that I said, oh well, we're only going to deal with SO2 one the uh, connected component. Okay. Well, O2 one has four connected components. Two of those have negative one as eigenvalues, but SO2 one has positive. Uh, everything has one as an eigenvalue, but some of the eigenvectors, eigen, the other eigenvalues, can be negative. And in fact, you get examples of these things, and we'll talk about this more later on. But here's the proof of why you can get these things with negative eigenvalues for the other ones. Here we go. It's really hard. It's a hard proof. Because what does negative eigenvalue do for the plus and minus? It does it by, it just takes the upper nap, it takes the future to the past and the past to the future. Really screwing up, you know, any physics that might happen to go on, and you get it like this. And if you don't think that's the, exactly the way I found it out, <laughs> you're crazy. This is exactly, I had built these by hand a long time ago. It's like, hey, I did something wrong. Oh, no, I did something right. This is amazing. It's like, oh, that just, because it flips it. Because So what, what a transformation will do is it'll move it, and then it'll, it'll move it, and then it'll flip it, right? So you can kind of imagine. And what we'll talk about a little bit uh, on, on, well, on foreshadowing, but a little bit on uh, tomorrow is that even though the underlying surface is, that's changing the orientation of the underlying surface, the orientation of the three manifold is still, it's still oriented. So you have an unoriented, sur you have an oriented surface, uh, uh, oriented uh, Lorentzian manifold over an unoriented surface, which I think is kind of weird and disturbing. But. It's a manifold with a free group. Yeah, you can't really get too you can't really get too many extensions of free groups. There's, yeah, it's hard to do that. You can get if you throw away the free free part. If you worry about if you allow fixed points, you can get certain things. So what what you can do is if you just imagine you could take this group where you have these three point, crooked planes separated by, and you take reflections on each one of these spines, you get a proper action, but it doesn't. It's not pr free. It, it it fixes that. It'll fix that line. So you have to throw away all the lines and all the iterates of that line, so those, those three lines. But you still get a proper action, but it's not. But you get free groups. So you do get orbifolds to some extent. Okay. There's also things about what happens on elliptics. This is not really the proper actions, but uh, I know that Thierry Barbeau does a lot of stuff with uh, elliptics and, and actually thinking of these as not just gluing the elliptics groups. But that's not, that's not where I'm going today or tomorrow. Okay. These are all handle bodies. That's what uh, that's what that's what uh, Francois, uh, uh, Fanny, and, and Jeff proved. This 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 proves that all of these are these are uh, handle bodies. So they're all what are, tame tame manifolds. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, they're all handle bodies. But but it's they I, I believe. Did you prove this by doing it by proving it by proving the crooked plane conjecture? You, that was what that was your implication that all of them were handle bodies. Oh right, right, yeah, yeah. There's another proof, and I'm not going to. You'll have to ask Fanny. She'll she, she'll tell you other things that I don't know. Um. Uh, but yeah. Right. But that's what we're gonna, we're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. So I'm not, I, I'm going to talk about what those parameters are and what you get and how to how to talk. We'll, we're going to go through this. I, I just want to today. I just want to start off and and build these things and show you what they look like, as as opposed to talking about the the uh, the the whole space. Which they, they again the 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 method that uh, the DJ, DGK, which well, I just call them DGK when they're not around. Um, figured out was very. They have a lot. They can describe so many things. It's really, really clever. But, uh, but I'll leave them to describe everything of that. But we'll sh show you pictures. That we'll show you the pictures that Bill used to show. If you've seen a, a lecture by Bill Goldman, you get to see these crazy pictures that we have. And I'll show you some of those tomorrow. Free group and two, two, two generators. So, so if you have a free group and two generated, well, this is tomorrow. Maybe I'll, I'll leave this to tomorrow, but I'll talk about this tomorrow. So, all right. Any other questions? The picture, the three-dimensional picture looks like the cut in the 
Yeah, that's all it is. This is another way to think about these is just shock keywords. These are just shock keywords. And so you have a, a combination theorem like, like you did before. It's a, it's a little bit harder to prove the, that they fill up all of three space. And there are examples where they kind of go off. It's hard to, I don't know that anybody's ever constructed those examples, but it's hard to construct those examples where they, they don't. But there are, you have to actually prove that they all, one of, the, one of the harder proofs of this all is that once you have this fundamental domain, do they fill up all of three space? And you can, and, and it is, it's, it's, it's one of those, it's a lot of estimates. It's, it's kind of it reminds me of a lot of what Margulis did originally. A lot of estimates like how, how much, do, you take a ball and you say, oh, well, how much does it squeeze it and how much doesn't it squeeze it and stuff like that. So, um, and you kind of want to build it. You want to say, oh, I don't, I, I don't have any accumulation points. And it takes a while to prove that, but it's not, not, it's not that exciting to prove it. It's exciting to know it, but it's not exciting to prove it. All right. <laughs>